Hello everyone. Welcome to uh, the session about uh, using Kubernetes to build a data lake for our AI and machine learning workloads and also how we used it for the entire AI and ML infrastructure stack. I am Uday Bafana, a principal product manager at Red Hat responsible for AI, machine learning and big data in the storage uh, business unit. With me is Peter McCannon, and he works in the Red Hat AI Center of Excellence as a principal software engineer working on AI and machine learning technologies. And we have collaborated on this project for close to a couple of years. So this talk is, is about our journey that we went through and the experiences we had while we were trying to build an AI and machine learning platform at Red Hat and also about the challenges we faced on how we solved them. We also open source the platform now. It's available uh, for everyone to download and, and get it up and running and try it out. And Pete will talk to you about those details too. So let's get started. As you know, AI and machine learning are growing workloads within the enterprise today. And as we started more of these uh, workloads pop up in the enterprises and at Red Hat, we saw a set of common challenges uh, that arise from arose from each of these. The biggest challenge we saw was uh, the lack of readily usable data. All of the data in the company was siloed in different locations uh, by departments or by the owners of the data sets. And the authentication and authorization policies were different and preventing access. This siloed data set also created a challenge for teams that wanted to collaborate and it prevented teams from collaborating and, and working together. We also saw that uh, data scientists especially were not happy with the long turnaround times they had using the traditional IT ticketing processes to get infrastructure up and running. They wanted something that's real time, quick and ready on the cloud. The, the, the final challenge was also lack of uh, the right tools and infrastructure for the data engineers and data scientists. Data engineers needed something that was easy to govern their data and, and transform the data as they needed. And data scientists wanted a cloud-like experience and flexibility in their, in their execution. So once we listed, uh, listened to them and, and figured out the kind of common challenges and high priority issues we were facing, we came up with a set of design points around what we needed to do in our, uh, in our next generation architecture. So we set up three goals. First is, we needed a centralized shared infrastructure that all the teams could use. This centralized shared infrastructure broke down the silos for data and also enabled collaboration across the teams because they were all working off of the common platform that they had. We also wanted something that was more self-service driven so uh, the customers can get a more cloud-like experience and also have a, a real time a workflow like they are used to. We also wanted to build an infrastructure that was uh, flexible in, in, in the sense that it could allow bring your own uh, tools kind of a workflow, but also provide with a set of standard libraries that can be used and standard tooling that can be used. So uh, data scientists can get off the ground and get their work done faster. So once we set those goals uh, for um, the challenges we identified, we also uh, looked at the end-to-end -end AI and machine learning workflow within our customers and internally within our company. So we wanted to figure out the different personas that were uh, emerging in, in the AI and machine learning landscape. And we figured out uh, it, it's anywhere from the business side of the world, which is business leadership that uh, has financial goals to your traditional IT operations that has a broad swath of responsibilities across the entire AI and machine learning lifecycle. And your app developers who create the end user applications that are being used, that use the machine learning workflows and the AI models. We also saw the emergence and, and prominence of uh, new roles like data engineers that work with a lot of the data sets coming in, the ML engineers that are really worried about and look at the tools to develop and the models for machine learning, and also data scientists who are the real end users of, of AI and machine learning platforms to create models and predict predictions. So we took uh, the personas that we developed and put it against the fabric of uh, the AI and machine learning workflow to figure out where the different touch points were and where each role interacts with the system and the things we needed to do to optimize uh, the system for each of those roles. So with that in mind, 
we 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 set out uh, trying to solve the problem. Um, now that we have a set of challenges, uh, the personas and, and user requirements, and our goals, we set out to solve the problem and find the right technologies. Pretty early on in the game, we figured out that uh, containerizing on Kubernetes was the right solution for us going forward, and would help us to build the next generation AI and machine learning platform. Kubernetes gave us pretty much uh, most of uh, the design points we wanted that we set as goals. It gave us the agility to quickly respond to end users and, and, and also provide it in a self-service way so customers can uh, compute, uh, manage compute resources as they need it. It also gave us the portability of a common runtime that can be used to move containers between, uh, between company uh, at the edge and the, on the core and across different departments or across the company. It also gave us more importantly the flexibility we needed in, in the today's AI and ML environments to be agile and, and, and flexible. Like for example, we wanted to run multiple versions of the same uh, application or the same model in parallel to figure out the different outcomes and what the impact would be. And Kubernetes and containers gave us an easy way to do it. And of course, Kubernetes is highly scalable and it's known for scalability. So that was, uh, that was a really good thing to have too. So uh, for this part of my presentation, uh, I, will fo I will focus on how we build the data lake and the data management capabilities uh, for our AI and ML uh, infrastructure that we have, and, and then hand over to Pete to talk about the higher layers of uh, the, the machine learning libraries and the capabilities that we build on top of this data lake. From a technology perspective, like I said, we chose Kubernetes, and for the storage layer, we also chose to build it on Ceph and Rook, and we'll talk more about it. So when we started to set uh, uh, de design the data lake and the data architecture for our, our AI and machine learning infrastructure in at Red Hat, we set out to understand the workflows and a couple of workflows stood out as the must support. So we, we, we learned early on that there is a requirement uh, for uh, certain Kubernetes clusters to have storage that was localized within the Kubernetes cluster. So this would either be for reasons of uh, security and compliance where certain data sets need to be siloed off or for uh, data that was temporal and not of long-term use or, or also for uh, things like uh, persistent storage uh, for time-based uh, operations and such. And for such for these clusters where the storage has to run with the Kubernetes cluster, running the storage inside Kubernetes was uh, the best way for us to go forward. And that gave us the ease of use and simplicity for the cluster admin uh, to manage both the compute and storage as one entity. But like I said in the initial uh, part, we also had a goal to build a centralized data lake that could be used across the organization, a data lake that could be shared across multiple Kubernetes clusters, and, and that would be the single source of truth for all data sets being used in the organization. So what we really wanted uh, in the long term is what you see sort of in the rightmost rectangle in, in this picture. We realized that both apps and users will need a combination of uh, some local storage within their Kubernetes cluster that's running, uh, that's easy to manage and easy to access, but also the need for a long-term centralized data lake where all the data can be funneled into and stored for things like machine learning and analysis. So with that in mind, uh, we set out to choose the right technology. Like we said, uh, we chose Ceph for uh, building the data lake. Ceph, as you know, is an open source storage project that provides a uniform, uh, that provides multiple protocol support for object, file, and block. It also is software defined and is highly scalable. So Ceph fit our needs uh, from that aspect. We also chose to use the Rook operator which is uh, the operator that will enable us to spin up and manage a Ceph cluster within an existing Kubernetes cluster for those locations where they wanted a, a converge-like offering where compute and storage were running in the same Kubernetes cluster. Ceph has been around for a couple of decades and is highly known in the industry and, and is a very vibrant open source project. So for, uh, for now, I'll focus a little bit more on Rook and, and what it does because it's relatively new. Rook is, is a Kubernetes operator that can enable uh, customers to spin up entire Ceph clusters within their existing Kubernetes cluster. So Rook will uh, take the right daemons required for Ceph, like Mons, MGRs, OSGs, and managers, 
and spin them spin those containers up inside a kubernetes cluster and create a full fledged ceph cluster within an existing kubernetes cluster which means you have a full functional storage cluster to use right away for all your applications running in that cube cluster rook also uh, more excitingly does all the required configuration and backend operations required to support the native cube way of accessing storage using rwx volume claims rwo volume claims and the newly emerging bucket claims so this combination of the ability to spin up an entire cluster and automatically configure it for the kubernetes storage workflows made a rook the obvious choice for us to manage self clusters within kubernetes And of course, like I said, for uh, we also needed a centralized data lake that could store all the long-term data assets of a company. And for that, we chose to build it on Ceph, also running on Linux. And, and in this case, the majority of the data was stored in object storage. As you know, object storage is emerging and, and standard that is becoming pervasive for storing large data sets, uh, especially unstructured data. And Ceph has a rich set of object storage capabilities. So that gave us uh, a really good flexibility. Again, to recap, we used Rook to use to instantiate Ceph clusters inside Kubernetes for localized storage operations and clusters. And we used Ceph object storage uh, as the centralized data lake running across the organization. We also did something really exciting to ease a data engineer's uh, task when we built this infrastructure and data lake. We provided a way to automatically process incoming data into the cluster and place it in the right location within the data lake. So this was built using a combination of Ceph bucket notifications, Kafka, and Knative serverless. So in this architecture, multiple data streams would bring in data from external sources into a Ceph bucket. Ceph would then trigger a bucket notification uh, alerting about the presence of new data or the changes in existing data sets and these bucket notifications would be received by Kafka, which would process them and send them over to Knative Serverless. Knative Serverless would then spin up the right serverless function to process this data source. Also things like removing PII information, tagging any required metadata tags, adding the right security policies, and then move this new data set into the right location in the data lake so any data scientists and engineers can have access to it in real time. So this operation freed up the data engineer from having to manually process all the incoming data and almost created a real-time data ingest pipeline that automatically processes the data, sanitizes it, does the required metadata operations, and puts it in the right location. And for example, if you're in the medical field, uh, we prototyped this with an X-ray engine where there's multiple X-rays or CT scan medical images coming into a Cephalo bucket. And as soon as the images are stored on the bucket, a notification goes out from Ceph to Kafka and then to Knative. And Knative would spin up the right function that looks at these images, anonymizes them, removes all the PIA information, and then moves them to the right uh, bucket that can be used for machine learning engineers that work on this anonymized data. So the combination of Ceph and Rook and this our data pipeline ingest solution that we created gave us a pretty good benefit uh, for creating the data lake and the data infrastructure and also a good basic framework that we can build more workloads on. And at this point, I'll transition to Pete to go over some of uh, the AI and machine learning workflows and tools. Thanks. Over to you, Pete. Thanks, Uday. The Open Data Hub project started internally within Red Hat as a data store for our own data engineers and data scientists, hence the name Data Hub. Early on, we realized that the data scientists and the data engineers requirements for tools and AI ML components are different than DevOps requirements. They are mostly UI driven. They avoid using terminal commands and expect the tools to include all their favorite AI ML libraries that they are accustomed to using. Collaboration and sharing is also an important requirement for their workflows to successfully deliver models to production. The main pain points are sharing machine learning work initially done in notebooks, moving the model to production from those notebooks, and of course, managing the model while in production. This includes monitoring it, making sure predictions are accurate, watching for data drift, 
managing resource usage for CPU, GPU, memory, and lots more. Open Data Hub has an upstream and downstream relationship with many open source projects. Open Data Hub derives some functionality from the upstream Kubeflow project, which we'll talk about more in a bit. However, Open Data Hub also downstreams from other open source projects such as Selden, Kafka, that uh, Uday talked about earlier, uh, Spark as well, Grafana, and Prometheus. All this to provide a comprehensive end-to-end -end AI ML platform that runs on OpenShift. In many cases, enhancements and changes made in the Open Data Hub project are also offered back upstream to the original open source communities, such as a variety of changes that we sent upstream to Kubeflow for proper OpenShift platform support. Talking about the personas that Uday uh, laid out for us, um, in the context of Open Data Hub, for the data analyst persona, Open Data Hub provides integration for data lakes, such as an S3 interface to Ceph object storage. There's SQL databases, such as Postgres SQL and MySQL, and data streaming using Kafka Strimzy. For data exploration, Open Data Hub includes the Superset and Hue projects. Superset, you can think of as an open source version of Tableau. For data processing, Open Data Hub provides Spark and Spark SQL Thrift Server. Finally, there are metadata tools such as the Hive Metastore. The data scientist accesses the data through the various storage interfaces uh, Uday just um, described. Jupyter Hub is also provided for a notebook development environment integrated with OpenShift authentication and can also make use of available GPU resources if they're enabled on the Kubernetes nodes. Multiple tools for model training and verification are provided, such as for the frameworks TensorFlow and PyTorch, and of course, Spark. Open Data Hub also provides pre-trained models as part of its AI library component. So, pre-trained models for things like fraud detection and uh, various other types of uh, machine learning algorithms. For creating machine learning pipelines, data scientists can use Argo, and we're going to talk about Kubeflow a bit more, but it can also make use of Kubeflow pipelines. For the DevOps engineers, they're provided with monitoring tools such as Prometheus and Grafana for uh, the observation of all the components in the AI ML end-to-end -end platform. And also there's model serving tools such as TensorFlow Serving and Selden that are provided within Open Data Hub. The Open Data Hub project is a meta project to integrate all these open source tools and provide an end-to-end -end AI ML platform on OpenShift. So the Meta project integrates these open source projects into one project that makes it easier to be consumed by users. Going back to sort of where all these projects come into play in the overall ML workflow, it starts with uh, data prepping and ETLing that data into a data lake or storage of some kind and making it accessible to the data scientists. The next phase is the model development, which includes feature selection, model creation, training, and validation. Finally, the last phase is moving that model out and serving the model in production. And this is not sort of a, a one-stop model serving thing, but it goes through a constant loop of optimization. So models in production are actually monitored um, to see how the model is performing uh, against live data. So that cycle of monitoring, optimizing, and serving, that's constant and it happens for the lifetime of the model. And that encompasses a collaboration between DevOps, data scientists, data engineers, and business developers. So Open Data Hub sort of provides a, a unifying um, uh, umbrella, if you will, for the activities of all those different per personas. 
As part of the data, the Open Data Hub project, we see a great deal of value in the uh, Kubeflow project. Um, so we dedicate our efforts to enable Kubeflow on OpenShift and integrate the Open Data Hub with Kubeflow in an installation based on the Operator Lifecycle Manager, which is a key component in OpenShift 4. It is, not, it is now integrated to Open Data Hub and runs on OpenShift. Um, Kubeflow brings multiple new AI ML capabilities and features. So for distributed model training, we have TensorFlow jobs and PyTorch jobs, uh, MPI jobs for model serving. Again, they're Selden, but there's also a new project called KF Serving, which uh, provides an abstraction layer over the various different types of serving frameworks. For pipelines, we have Kubeflow pipelines based on Argo. And as part of the goal of all this, we upstream any enhancements back to the Kubeflow project. So we also work with the Kubeflow community to add OpenShift as one of the supported platforms for Kubeflow. As we show with the red arrow in the website menu on the right, you see a list of um, uh, cloud platforms and OpenShift is one of those that is um, provided as supported for uh, the latest Kubeflow versions. So we've released the Open Data Hub 0 0.7 beta operator with Kubeflow integrated into that. Open Data Hub is an operator currently available in the OpenShift Operator Hub community. It's one of the community operators. Um, you'll find it in the embedded OpenShift uh, operator hub that ships with OpenShift 4. Uh, we recently released Open Data Hub version 0.5.2 that was built using the Ansible operator, includes many of the uh, AI ML tools we talked about previously. Um, but we also support a, a dually a new version of the operator that is based on the Kubeflow Golang KF Cuddle operator. And that gives us this mechanism for better integration with Kubeflow. So, this dual mode, these two operators, 052 is to support so-called legacy deployments. That going forward will only have bug fixes. Um, however, with the Open Data Hub 0 0.7 operator based on Kubeflow, it integrates with Kubeflow, includes Kubeflow components, as well as some of the legacy Open Data Hub tools that have been migrated to the KF Cuddle custom resource definition. So that version will be the target for all new feature development. Open Data Hub is an open source community and we welcome contributions and engagement. Our main site is located at opendatahub.io and our code base can be found in GitLab and GitHub. Um, there's two areas for that. Uh, GitLab sort of hosts some of the, the legacy uh, features of um, uh, Open Data Hub, where the manifest development um, for features in the Open Data Hub 0 0.7 are hosted in GitHub. Uh, we have biweekly open community meetings, and the calendar is posted in the GitLab community link you see there. And we also have an AIML YouTube channel for all of the video tutorials we do, as well as mailing lists as listed here on the slide. Thank you for joining our talk today. And now we'll be happy to take any questions. So uh, Uday, uh, do you want to take that question number two there? Yep, Pete, yeah. So so the question uh, question number two, uh, is there redundancy between the data stored on the data lake and the local storage? If yes, how is synchronization performed? Yes, there is a way to synchronize data between your local storage and uh, the network data lake to using active -act to replication, which SEP supports. So you could set it up for data to go both the ways or to just go one way and, and stay in the data lake uh, forever. 
it's primarily driven by object and we are making more enhancements in Ceph with the community for a block and also for file, but that capability does exist today. And I will take number three. And the question is, could you provide links to the product or download page? Um, it's important to emphasize the Open Data Hub project. And I'm assuming we're talking about Open Data Hub as opposed to the, the Ceph project. Um, the information for that product can be found, or project, I'm sorry, can be found at opendatahub.io. So we have uh, documentation there, blog posts. Um, and we host in GitLab the, the source for the various components there. Um, there are pieces that are hosted in GitHub for, for legacy reasons. Um, also, with uh, OpenShift 4, it has an embedded operator lifecycle manager. And in fact, the easiest way to install Open Data Hub is just to make use of that. So you go to the OpenShift 4 console and uh, you would bring up the catalog. Uh, the first item there will be AI and machine learning. And you can just type in Open Data Hub and it will come up as one of the community operators. And you can click on that tile and it will sort of work you through uh, basically the steps for installing that into the cluster directly. Hopefully that answers mm -hmm. the question. I can take question number four, uh, Pete. Uh, the question is, in the automated ingestion pipeline, does the k-native serverless function read directly from Ceph, or does the message consumed from Kafka contain within itself the data payload as well? So uh, both the modes are, are supported, in fact. So today, uh, Ceph sends a notification to Kafka, and Kafka initiates uh, the k-native interaction. But that is all the metadata flow. The real data is still on Ceph, uh, and so Ceph is the one that starts the notification process with bucket notifications. Where there is also a way that we prototyped upstream where uh, Ceph can directly send a notification to Knative and trigger the help tr trigger the right function. That is being uh, tested right now. It's upstream, and we will productize it uh, in the next coming days. So depending on your scalability need and product needs, you could either use a message broker like Kafka in the middle or you could directly hook up Ceph uh, buckets to Knative. Uh, number five, I guess, Uday, we can both sort of have a stab mm -hmm. at. It says, uh, the question is, do you back up your data? If yes, how do you back up your data? And probably, Uday, that speaks to the Ceph architecture, I would, mm -hmm. I would say. Sure, Apit. So uh, the backing up data part uh, today, it's through, uh, through replication. Again, uh, Ceph supports native replication for all the protocols, uh, so like RBD for block and primarily for object. And since most of the data we have is an object, the way we back up is using uh, the multi-site feature where uh, we create a second site and keep a copy of all the data in. And, and Pete can talk about some of uh, the next generation backup uh, workflows that we're working on more around time-based backup and, and restoration and auto restoration and stuff. And we are making some progress there. It's a work in progress for uh, more uh, real-time backup and stuff. Okay, and number six. Six, yeah, six, six is all yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the question is, with respect to the Open Data Hub solution architecture, is the Hive metadata catalog used as the primary data catalog for example, for governance purposes, or does it have more of an internal use case? It is provided generally. Um, there are other solutions that we're looking to incorporate in Open Data Hub with respect to governance, and um, there's a evaluation going on of some other candidate open source components that could fulfill sort of a broader governance solution there. So things like uh, Atlas, uh, Ranger, uh, Egeria, these are all components that we're actively looking at for providing sort of a broader uh, data governance and um, self-service uh, type of capability for Open Data Hub with respect to data cataloging. Do you want me to read that yeah. next one? Uh, the next question is, 
looking to use this for a research product on large archive feeding data into such design as Ceph chosen for weather data. So the use case is large volumes of, of weather data. Um, the concern is pulling our access into our archive using this design given that it's 40 petabytes or more and there are security and uh, perhaps uh, restricted information there as well. Looking for comparisons here, has this been pass, uh, passed on to the new CNCF research group for review as working with them for reviews? So um, Open Data Hub is uh, an open source project. It is not currently affiliated with uh, CNCF in terms of under any of the umbrella uh, projects for that. Um, we'd be probably interested in, the community would be interesting in hearing more about this use case. The community meets bi-weekly on Mondays um, and on our Open Data Hub IO website, uh, we have the upcoming schedule, I believe, for uh, the community meeting. So we'd welcome this this use case and other use cases like it to to um, to have for further discussion. Uh, number um, so eight. It, yeah, number eight. Oh, I think it's a few questions, same as number eight. As you scroll through, it's, it's almost the same question. What distro does this run on and stuff? So it's all your speed. Yeah. Um, so one form of the question is it OpenShift only? The other form is does this run on stock Kubernetes? OpenShift is Kubernetes. However, it does have extensions, and some of those extensions are uh, used. Um, natively in Open Data Hub. So it is targeted for OpenShift. A lot of the constructs will be obviously familiar in terms of um, deployments and pods and services and things like that. But we also make use of uh, uh, resource objects in OpenShift called uh, routes, which are actually a higher level of abstraction of um, ingress resources. So there's various um, sort of areas where we are specifically providing um, a tool, a, a suite of tools basically, uh, specifically designed for open um, OpenShift. Yep. So question number nine is more of a comment. Uh, so yes, piloting now and using many of the same tools. We would love to have more feedback and even have you collaborate with the community. Like Pete was referring, we do have regular meetings for the community that are on the website. So please feel free to join in, share feedback, and we can learn from you, and you can get more information from the community too. And question number 10 is the same. Uh, the session in the slides, yes, we will follow the regular CNCF path of uh, making everything available uh, as soon as uh, CNCF makes uh, all of the sessions available, the session and the slides. I think question 11, Pete just answered, what versions does this run on? And 12, we just answered. 13, uh, so Pete, 13 is, is again similar to what we're talking about. Can this run on native Kubernetes? And you talked about the extensions and stuff, so yep. Ah, here's one. Sorry, there's multiple pages to the <laughs> Q&A. So uh, the question, does Open Data Hub support GPU resource sharing scheduling? Um, it does provide GPU support in terms of um, automatically building um, GPU-enabled notebooks that can be launched from Jupyter Hub, which is one of the components in, in Open Data Hub. So the actual, um, the details of GPU enablement, I've done talks uh, about this um, in other venues like uh, uh, DevNation and stuff like that. Um, it's enabled as an operator in OpenShift and Kubernetes, NVIDIA actually provides the, the GPU operator for that. So um, that's how the enablement is done. Um, a, another question, we're just closing up here, running out of time. We need disconnected install for ODH. It is not supported yet. Uh, yes, we're aware of that. It's, uh, it's an issue that we're um, still looking into. And 
Also, we have data sets in NFS, large seismic data sets. How do you picture we can consume these data? Um, maybe that's the last question for you, Uday. Sure, yeah. Uh, so you can consume them using the generative PV uh, uh, persistent volume construct uh, that the Kubernetes provides and OpenShift provide. Or you can also do out of band access, uh, but we recommend the, the persistent volume uh, way of consuming the data sets already in NFS because that follows with the, the data on the control path that's emerging in the Kubernetes way to read and write persistent data. And I believe that's all we have time for. And we do appreciate exactly. all the, the attendees uh, <laughs> joining our talk today. Yep, thanks folks. It's been a good interactive session. So thanks for the questions and looking forward to interacting with uh, most of you on one of the community meeting days. Thank you. Thanks.